this is Dr. Sarajukin and today we'll talk about immune disorder and to start the review of immune disorders I'd like to have brief anatomy and physiology overview to know about the immune system we need to know organs that are responsible for that and uh, immune system is made up of complex groups of cells and organs that we can find throughout the human body. Primary organs of immunity such as bone marrow of course and the thymus gland and as we know th the role of thymus gland decreases with the age and secondary organs of immune systems like you can name liver, tonsils, spleen, lymph node, um, lymph node, lymphatic system and um, those are uh, groups of organs that are responsible for immune system. Again uh, the main organ in adult uh, person is primary organ in adult person is bone marrow and thymus glands shrink with the age of course. The cells of immune systems um, involve uh, lymphocytes and lymphocytes are the major cells of immune systems. They would arise and uh, develop in primary organs and um, they will create uh, the immunity of the organism and I'll touch on that in a little bit um, later uh, but to understand how immune system works this is a brief review of uh, types of immunity types of immunity are uh, divided by active and passive and active natural immunity can be described as someone experiencing or having the disease and a good example will be mom active art uh, i'm sorry act active artificial immunity is receiving a vaccination such as mmr or any other um, vaccine that will induce response from the person immune response passive natural immunity it's introduction of antibodies and um, the good example of it is the transmission of antibodies from mother to the baby uh, or mother from uh, actually maternal fetal transmission and passive artificial immunity is transmission of uh, antibodies via immunization or injection of antibodies so natural resistance uh, is a term that can be described while we using uh, the while we describing the immunity and natural resistance is the inherited immunity that uh, a person or the individual may have based on the genotype and uh, basically on genotype and uh, we can also attribute it to uh, genetic makeup uh, certain ethnic background or racial uh, background but again s some would uh, attribute natural resistance and focus more on racial or ethnic background but when we're talking about that of course this is a consequence of genotype it's not uh, the consequence of something that uh, someone has Mediterranean origin or uh, African American they will have certain type of natural resistance. The key point is here that people may have dif different genetic makeup and they will have different natural resistance. From here 
we may derive that some races, uh, species, particular um, groups of populations may be more resistant to certain diseases than the others. So this is a small overview of types of immunity and they, uh, of course we need to know what uh, types of immunity are uh, as listed here. So common types of diseases are um, that related to immune system is immunodeficiency, lack of immune response to secondary to one or the other uh, cause. It can be natural immunodeficiency or acquired autoimmune um, disorders as, as well as our isoimmune disorders. So immunodeficiency uh, is again can be acquired or um, developed by the organism also on, on the other hand autoimmune disorders it's immunity against the organism immunity against the um, organism of itself isoimmune disorders it's uh, immunity uh, developed against other human uh, disorders, of course, can be vary, can vary, and um, depending on the organ, on organ system and affected, and whatever pathogen is involved, or uh, maybe there is no pathogen involved, like in or in case of autoimmune disorders. So, but these are three main types of immune disorders. What kind of diagnostic testing we can do for these disorders? These are uh, many, many uh, tests can be done, but this is a summary of uh, common immune disorder testing. Skin testing is uh, very common for testing for uh, common allergies, and the allergies are the responses to antigens and there are hundreds or even thousands of possible allergens around us that can cause allergic reactions and it's we can use this term interchangeably antigens versus allergens but these are allergens because they are causing the allergic reaction the allergens such as uh, dust pet dandruff, uh, chocolate, uh, ragweed, smoking or cigarette smoke, pollen, seafood, uh, certain plants, uh, industrial paint, chemical dyes, cleaners, uh, latex, some of you can be very familiar with it or uh, have misfortune to have it developed working in hospital setting. And all of these can be tested by skin testing. So skin testing is intradermal injection involving a small amount of suspected antigen into the skin. So when this happens, we can induce the response to certain allergens. Another option here to place a small antigen soaked patch against the person's skin and we will have allergic response and uh, we will induce it so we may determine the allergy. Again, allergy to the antigen will be positive if person develops inflammatory response which may be erythema or developing old vesicle or wheel in here and it will show that patient is sensitive to uh, the antigen. So after the antigen has been identified that we may proceed with desensitization treatment. When we're trying to desensitize we may try to start injecting an increased amount of allergen over a long time. Uh, 
basically long period of time and this way we will try to desensitize a person from the allergen this may induce uh, allergic response and certainly if you are practicing in primary care uh, this is something that has to be delegated or in uh, I guess in primary care we don't use word delegated or referred to uh, allergy specialist and the treatment for allergies of course commonly include antihistamine and the best treatment ever which your patients may um, raise some eyebrows to avoid the allergen like um, I remember a patient who had allergy to printer ink in uh, my practice and she would no, not um, choose another printer such as laser versus ink and uh, it was really easy fix to convince her eventually to opt out of printing at home and send it to print to outside facility like Kinko's or FedEx but uh, this sometime you would be surprised the responses it will induce to uh, get rid of the allergen so uh, the getting rid of allergen it's the best it's the best way to deal with um, allergies and allergy treatment to remove the source to remove the source on the other hand, uh, there may be other type of reactions uh, to antibodies and one of the common examples is hypersensitivity reactions when we are performing blood transfusion and uh, this will uh, present as uh, blood count indicating low level of uh, red cells white cells and platelets antibodies can be formed against all blood elements blood cells and when this happens the patient will develop anemia leukopenia and thrombocytopenia so again this may be delayed um, uh, consequences of the reactions of course the um, increase in temperature and uh, somatic uh, responses and patient may become tachycardic or hypotensive hypertensive uh, and blood transfusion reaction so it's important to recognize those and monitor and I won't be spending time on it because this will be a review of your medical surgical nursing from your um, basic nursing courses so but what happens antibodies will form against the blood elements and uh, will this will induce all these uh, negative consequences if we perform comps test comps test will indicate the formation of antibodies on the red blood cells so this test can be used when we are proceeding with comp test the test is used to determine blood type and also we also can um, uh, proceed with diagnosis of hemolytic anemia and uh, a comp test is also used and this is probably uh, that you seen or heard the use of it about the use of it it's the uh, checking for presence of maternal antibodies uh, against the fetal blood type and um, this of course may occur when uh, we are looking for erythroblastosis fetalis autoimmune disorders and there are many many of those can be diagnosed for non-specific blood tests such as uh, anti-nuclear antibody which will be present with uh, autoimmune liver disease or an another common example is SLE or systemic 
lupus erythematous and the um, patient will present with positive ANA. Again, what use of ANA is overused. Um, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Use of ANA is uh, attributed mostly to diagnosing of um, systemic lupus erythematous, but uh, in reality, ANA, it's non-specific test and um, ANA can uh, be signifying an autoimmune process which uh, may require further evaluation. Of course, this SLE can be uh, determined by the presence of anti-lupus antibody. If an anti-lupus antibody is a specific antibody such as rheumatoid factor and rheumatoid factor or anti-lupus antibody will be specific antibodies we can test for and RF will be indicative of rheumatoid arthritis. So immunodeficiency disorders can be diagnosed uh, by blood testing and uh, by blood testing I mean testing of leukocytes and which may reveal low leukocytes counts, certain leukocytes counts, specifically B, leukocyte, um, B and T lymphocytes. So another way to determine immunodeficiency disorder, of course, uh, to try to look for a specific antibody that will signify presence of uh, offensive agents, um, for instance, uh, antibody. We are looking for antibodies when we are testing for HIV uh, virus presence, and which may um, be indicative of HIV exposure, even though the patient will not have uh, the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome yet. Let's talk in uh, more details ab about hypersensitivity disorders. The, and hypersensitivity disorders are the disorders of overreaction of the immune system to an antigen or allergen. So hypersensitivity disorders can be further classified uh, related to autoimmunity, as I said, or isoimmunity or allergy. So, but again, all three types can be described as hypersensitivity disorders. Common reactions may include uh, hypersensitivity disorders presenting as allergies, such as um, environmental or um, acquired allergies uh, which may uh, represent as hay fever, types of asthma, or even poison ivy exposure. Sometimes the allergic reaction may present as um, uticaria and uh, commonly your patients may cause it hives or nettle rash, but what uticaria is it's a common reaction of the skin to an allergen, and basically it's a vascular reaction of the skin. So what happens uh, when external uh, and irritant uh, contacts the skin and it causes the development of the urticaria? So patient may develop uh, the wheels, uh, which slightly elevated erythematous uh, lesions, and uh, you will look uh, and see this uh, interlinked plateaus of redness, and um, you know another way to call them is hive. Also, patient will be uh, presenting with. Uh, itching and rubbing, 
and uh, which can further damage the skin. So this can happen secondary to insect bites, um, food, medication, and uh, utricaria, of course, it's not a disorder by itself. It's just a common uh, allergic reaction symptom, and um, this is a demonstrate some type of utricaria on a baby. And um, the treatment um, will be the first of all determining what the allergen was and uh, removing it from the contact as well as uh, proceeding with treatment and with treatment we may most commonly prescribe antihistamines. Hypersensitivity disorders uh, as allergies, uh, the symptoms may reveal elevated eosinophil count, uh, of course erythema, heat, swelling, and uh, Itching, chorizal symptoms may occur. Your patient will present with those. But again, depending on severity, patient may have just heavy fever versus full-blown anaphylactic uh, shock. And um, I talked in the review about the type of hypersensitivity disorders and uh, how to deal with them. But when we look at the symptoms, uh, elevated eosinophil count can be representative of allergens and uh, just a small review of eosinophils, what they do. Eosinophils, um, of course, try to produce some type of substances that will be harmful for invaders and eosinophil count even may um, increase while patient is a subject to helminitic infections or uh, some type of uh, intestinal worms like ascorides and uh, eosinophils trying to deal with those type of infections. So also eosinophils will increase with um, asthma and the cinephils may uh, represent some autoimmune disorders they may increase. So there is a phrase that can uh, summarize eosinophils and uh, their presence or their elevated count and it says worms, wheezes and weird diseases. So eosinophils may signify uh, the presence of worms wheezes and weird diseases. Where diseases here we uh, most likely were talking about autoimmune uh, some type of disorder. Hay fever is one of the common uh, hay hypersensitivity reaction disorders and uh, really uh, as dramatic as presentation will be of this and your patients will be complaining of uh, intolerable character of this and chorizal symptoms that occur. Uh, certainly this is not a life-threatening disease but this can cause lots of discomfort. Treatment may include the, again anti histamines and uh, most of them nowadays are over the counter and uh, the best treatment will be to remove the invading allergen. Sometimes the best will be for the patient to move to another area where the, the antigen, the offending allergen doesn't exist. So again uh, Asthma is a chronic allergic condition and I'm talking about bronchial asthma and of course this can be considered as a part of COPD however uh, I would like to bring our focus to more to juvenile asthma and um, 
while we're talking about juvenile asthma, uh, the common misconception is that the girls will develop asthma symptoms more often than boys. In reality, uh, boys have asthma twice as often as girls prior to puberty. After puberty, usually this ratio evens up, but for some reason uh, you can find some reports saying that um, female uh, children may have more instances of asthma. So what happens with asthma etiology of that is when an al allergen is uh, pre present in the bronchial tract, it may induce bronchospasm and uh, it may induce um, constriction of bronchi of um, the respiratory tract and of course this affects the muscles. And um, allergens also can cause inflammatory response and respiratory tract and it may result in shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. The patient may present with severe wheezes and the consequence of this will be severe anxiety some people will present. Severity again may vary from mild wheezing to uh, almost uh, respiratory arrest and uh, or may end up uh, unfortunately in the death of the patient. This is a severe asthma attack. The patient may develop cyanosis, become diaphoretic and um, patient may, um, when you see it, it's classic COPD tripod position, your patient may present with. But anyway, the treatment will include, uh, again, it's very easy, the avoidance of causative agents and um, also in introduction of bronchodilators and mucolytics. There is no cure for it, but it can be controlled very well if patient is compliant with medication regimen and uh, if patient uh, avoiding the allergens, of course smoking is one of the worst things someone can do for their health and especially for respiratory problems. And it's type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. I talk about it in the exam one review. Uh, just to add to it that uh, most common source of anaphylaxis is not the um, antibiotics in the hospital setting. Most commonly this is caused by a food allergy, nutritional allergy, and um, it usually happens in home or restaurant setting. Again, it, the nosocomial instances of anaphylaxis are not that often uh, uh, contrary to popular belief. Again, when we're talking about anaphylaxis, the reaction is uh, can be even mild, although we're always uh, considering this to be a life-threatening situation. Uh, just to overview of symptoms again, uh, dryness, itching of throat, e edema of the face, airways, patient may develop angioedema, uh, airway collapse, so all of this of course uh, needs to be addressed as soon as possible. And treatment, even emergency tracheostomy can be uh, pre uh, performed. Epinephrine, corticosteroids, and antihistamines can be administered, but um, of course, uh, as uh, I said in the exam review, epinephrine uh, most likely will be first 
first uh, line of defense or first line of health and the epinephrine as we know acts as a vasoconstrictor and a mu smooth muscle relaxant so again epinephrine will be the best uh, treatment uh, to deal with um, effects of anaphylaxis so allergic reaction also of course can be uh, triggered by uh, not triggered but be a consequence of increased histamine production that's why histamines are so important in the treatment but again uh, the treatment with epinephrine is the cornerstone is of the emergency treatment for this corticosteroids may be administered because of their anti-inflammatory properties again in um, exam review i talk about this so please listen to that too contact dermatitis is one of the um, allergic reactions and uh, acute versus chronic uh, again contact with the skin of the allergen can cause localized um, reaction with the erythema or even vascular re lesions uh, the reaction may actually spread from small localized spot to cover entire body of the effective in the video again we can evaluate for contract contact I'm sorry dermatitis by uh, allergy uh, skin patch testing versus uh, we also can do traditional skin testing for diagnosis of it the treatment should be targeted to avoid the an al allergen and usually mild cases of contact dermatitis will resolve by themselves one of the most important autoimmune disorders to talk about is rheumatic fever uh, of course group A streptococcus infection is to blame and that's why it's so important to recognize this and treat besides the all other consequences of ha having um, learning of pharyngitis secondary to streptococcus A such as the patient may even develop peritonsillar abscess but um, the sequela may have uh, very debilitating consequences so after um, one to four weeks after initial infection patient may develop uh, rheumatic fever and uh, it may be sudden or gradual and patient may have recurrence of fever malaise and uh, arthralgias and um, if it's the first occurrence it may be mild and it may resolve without leaving any permanent damage although secondary episodes or uh, for consequent episodes are more severe and may lead to permanent scarring and deformity of the connective tissues and most uh, dangerous uh, most dangerous uh, consequence of this will be damage to heart valve so valvular disease secondary to uh, rheumatic fever can um, lead to heart failure again um, Streptococcal infection may lead to rheumatoid, rheumatic, I'm sorry, rheumatic fever, but um, some individuals are more susceptible uh, to this than others. So if the certain proteins in the cardiac tissue uh, in uh, 
but cardiac tissue and cardiac connective tissue is uh, similar to strep proteins in streptococcus bacteria uh, rheumatic fever may be more um, prevalent in uh, individuals with these proteins and also genetically this will run in certain families so when exposures to uh, a streptococcus occurs then uh, the immune system uh, will start developing antibodies to attack the bacteria and eradicate it unfortunately the autoimmune character of the disease as you already know will be reflected in the damage to the valve as i said in the heart and also may uh, result in some joint damage and some arthritic consequences so patient may have at the same time myocarditis and arthritis treatment for the disease is uh, profil uh, I'm sorry treatment for the disease is uh, antibiotic treatment which will be most effective and if the individual is susceptible that means if individual has history of rheumatic fever or uh, even uh, the one way or the other the presence of uh, proteins in the connective tissues or that's similar to streptococcus A is determined then prophylactic treatment can be given to those individuals and by prophylactic treatments we mean loading with antibiotics or giving a single dose of antibiotics prior to invasive procedures such as uh, dental procedures that may induce the contact with blood as well as surgical procedures or diagnostic procedures so again the guidelines are continuously changing that sometime the doing a colonoscopy would warrant having uh, prophylactic treatment for um, for prophylaxis of this with erythromycin however if there is no biopsies are going to be taken nowadays uh, prophylaxis with erythromycin is not indicated but again recommendations may change and susceptible individuals may be still required to have some type of prophylaxis prior to invasive and relatively non-invasive procedures rheumatoid arthritis is one of the autoimmune disorders that will cause chronic inflammation of the connective tissue so somewhat similar to rheumatic fever although here this is a chronic disease there is no invading offending agents like streptococcus a so joint tissue will be primarily affected but again any tissue can be involved exact cause uh, of rheumatoid arthritis is unknown but um, it's uh, determined that while the rheumatoid arthritis occurs an abnormal antibody is produced that may attack the, the body's own connective tissue so this m will signify autoimmune attack rheumatoid factor presence will be indicative and diagnostic of the disease as well as the present clinical presentation of the uh, pr person who has the disease here is uh, the classic sign of uh, rheumatoid arthritis ulnar deviation and um, unfortunately the disease is progressive and without treatment patient may completely lose mobility in affected joints so rheumatoid arthritis 
begins with an inflammation or synovial lining of the affected joint and uh, patient will start experiencing pain uh, eventually develops stiffness and deformity cartilage of the joint may be destroyed and replaced with granulation tissue and uh, as disease progresses the completely the surface of the joint completely destroyed and replaced with fibrous tissue which uh, aid to the stiffness and joint really impossible to move so in addition to this patient may have uh, collagenous lesions on the lung blood vessels heart and eyes again don't forget that this is a connective tissue disease however again attack to the joints and especially small joints is very common this rheumatoid arthritis is usually affecting in adult small joints like hands and feet and um, usual presentation will be again like a classic sign of ulnar deviation rheumatoid arthritis cannot be cured like most of the autoimmune disorder however it, we may have um, palliative measures to alleviate the symptoms of the disease and we can start using anti-inflammatory medications analgesics and as well as biomodulators to try to control the disease but again there is no cure corticosteroids can be used and um, usually corticosteroid use isn't really uh, uh, indicated for long term but certainly they can be very helpful during the times of exacerbation myasthenia gravis is another um, autoimmune disorder and uh, myasthenia gravis basically the uh, translation is muscle fatigue or, or a grave weakness by of muscles and um, what happened in this disease the transmission of nerve impulses to muscle at the neuromuscular junction is affected but uh, when you're thinking about it to further research this there is really no muscle or nerve tissue disease nerve impulses are carried to the muscle by acetylcholine and uh, what happens unfortunately this nerve impulses aren't properly received by muscle tissue it's an error in transmission and why it happens because antibodies autoimmune antibodies attacking the receptors on the muscle tissues which blocks the transmission by acetylcholine and um, the poor transmission it leads to poor muscle contraction so basically this is a uh, communication disorder if you'd like to call it like this and again think about this as um, transmission disorders because nerves aren't hardwired to the muscle tissue the tissue receptor sites are um, trying to capture acetylcholine and which will result in muscle contraction but if we're having antibodies production that will attack this receptor sites then we are losing muscle contraction and stimulation and it results in weakness and loss 
of muscle function and fatigue. Onset of myasthenia gravis is uh, slow and it's difficult to diagnose because patients may complain of generalized weakness and uh, generalized weakness may, can be misdiagnosed as a chronic fatigue syndrome. It can be unfortunately misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia, which is very popular diagnosis nowadays. And um, it may take significant amount of time until patient will receive a, a certain uh, diagnosis. But there are some common symptoms and signs that may be leading to the diagnosis of myasthenia gra gravis, and it's usually the muscle involvement and muscle weakness signs. For instance, patient may experience diplopia, uh, secondary to weakening of um, optic muscles, as well as the patient may have ptosis, facial, uh, facial muscles and uh, affected, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, dystonia, difficulty with voice, and even patient will be having difficulty with facial expression. Uh, eventually the weakness uh, degree will uh, increase and the uh, patient may be progressively weakening. Although disease may vary, the, and by disease may vary, I mean the degree of weakness may vary depending on the time of the day and activities. Uh, generally, people will feel stronger in the morning because of the simple fact that acetylcholine will build up during the uh, night time and uh, the transmission of the nerve impulses will be easier. But as day goes by, acetylcholine stores diminish. So rest is necessary to restore muscle function. Um, some patients will prefer complete bed rest during exacerbation of the disease. So diagnostically it's a difficult disease to diagnose because uh, it may be confused with other neurologic disorders but um, the symptoms I was talking before may be pointing to the uh, maybe pointing to the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. The electromyography can uh, be performed to t test for muscle fatigue as well as presence of antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor may be suggestive of myasthenia gravis. So diagnostic tests also include tensilone testing. Tensilone is one of the medications to treat and uh, while administering tensilone intravenously patient may experience a short improvement in symptoms because of the short half-life of the medication. Also another test is very easy to perform. It's the uh, ice patch or ice pack test um, and if the optical, if the patient experiences ptosis, putting an ice pack on the affected eyelid may in increase the, I'm, I'm sorry, may decrease the symptoms of myasthenia gravis and ptosis will improve. So treatment wise, um, there are numerous things can be done and the um, patient may have uh, thymus gland removed, also the pharmacological treatment, there are many uh, substances available which may increase the concentration of acetylcholine at the synapse and uh, the others may prevent 
the breakdown of acetylcholine, which will create the buildup of that neurotransmitter and include and uh, sort of starts and increases the neurotransmission. Plasma exchange even can be done to remove the antibodies. And uh, because of all the treatments available, um, the mortality rate is relatively low with myasthenia gravis and approximately three to four percent. But patients still may die due to progressive muscle weakness that will lead to respiratory yeah, respiratory failure. So lupus can have two types and one of them cutaneous, the other is um, systemic. So uh, originally term lupus was referred to any chronic and destructive of type of skin lesion and if you don't know just a trivia the information the latin word lupus means wolf and uh, so the erythematous of course redness so the term came from 13th century uh, physicians or healers that at the time they when they saw the shape of color of the skin lesion they thought that it's a wolf bite so now we are referring to a rash of systemic lupus as a butterfly rash but again the lupus means wolf and lupus erythematous basically means the wolf bite red and wolf bite i guess so um so cutaneous or discoid lupus is only skin and cutaneous involvement. It will not be multi-system as uh, systemic lupus erythematous. And uh, some sources consider that discoid is a type of systemic, but it's just a smaller involvement. Um, Lupus antibodies will be present diagnostically and also antinuclear ap antibody may be present. But again, these are um, when lupus antibody is specific, the ANA antinuclear antibody is non specific. So when we're talking about systemic lupus erythematous, this is a chronic disease with remissions and exacerbations. Again, patient may have the characteristic butterfly rash. Uh, they may have some arthralgias present with fever and they may even present with weight loss patient may have uh, glomerular nephritis at the same time um, heart valve deformities don't forget that this is a connective tissue disease and uh, blood dyscrasias may also occur so diagnosis is again not an easy in this situation because uh, being uh, Diagnosed with lupus means having numerous and numerous tests done. The even presence of anti-lupus antibody, even though it's so specific, may not be leading to a conclusive diagnosis. So patient may have chronic um, chronic disease and uh, at the same time have remissions and exacerbations and complete remission is not uh, observed very often but it's still possible treatment is symptomatic there is no
cure per se. NSAIDs can be uh, administered analgesic medications for symptomatic relief. If the exacerbation is life threatening, of course, prednisone preparation or other IV forms of corticosteroids may be prescribed. But um, prognosis really depends what kind of what organs really affected and the severity of the disease. Uh, so mortality, morbidity data, survival with lupus in United States, um, you know, in Canada, European countries is approximately 95% in five years. So in 90 in 10 years and 78 in 20 years. So patients may die from renal insufficiency, endocarditis, cardiac failure, even septic consequences and pneumonia. But again, uh, the good news is that the morbidity uh, may be high, but mortality is relatively low. Scleroderma is another autoimmune disorder when patients will present with hardening and thickening of the connective tissues, which may include skin. The disease have periods of uh, exacerbations and remissions and a patient may present with joint contractures, Raynaud's phenomenon or syndrome and very thick leather-like shiny skin. So in severe cases patients may have um, I would say like dull appearance and the most uh, most dramatic case I remember the, because of the joint contractures and severe um, sclerosing of the skin, the patient couldn't really uh, bend her elbows and or smaller joint and was sitting like a doll. At the same time, her face had this expression of the um, doll like it was very difficult to move and I remember that IV sticks weren't possible with regular needles um, because of the thickness of the skin it wasn't possible to penetrate the skin with it and we had to call uh, respiratory therapists to use like ABG uh, type of equipment to try to get some success with uh, IV sticks and the patient wasn't impatient because of scleroderma it was actually for a cardiac abnormalities so there is no cure for scleroderma but uh, disease can be managed with more or less uh, degree of success if we administer anti-inflammatory medications immunosuppressants of some kind and uh, the physical therapy can be uh, beneficial for patients who suffer with this disease muscle stretching and strengthening and uh, again these patients may be having lots of resistance while doing these exercises so physical therapy may have very long-term character and um, unfortunately the character disease is progressive but uh, at the same time this can be manageable and degree of variation among patients who diagnose with disease is very big ISA immune disorders are disorders of, of reaction to the tissue of the same species, so it's the reaction to human tissue. So reaction may occur to a tissue transplant 
while the most common type is reaction versus uh, during the blood transfusion. And I talked about this very uh, little, very briefly in uh, exam review. So just for a review of this type of disorders uh, and blood reactions, let's uh, go over it and um, talk about blood types. So we have four blood types and uh, they are identified by presence or absence of A antigens. We have A, B, A, B, and O. So types O and A are most common in population. So type O is universal blood donor O and A, type AB is universal blood acceptor or recipient. Each red blood cell has a antigen and corresponding antibody. Blood type A, when we look at it, will have an A antigen and anti-B antibody, so it won't like B the type and will have antibody for it. B type will have a B antigen and anti-A antibody. O has no antigens and both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. AB has no antibody and um, A and B antigen. So those uh, patterns again presence of this will make O universal donor and AB universal recipient. So if we give, and hopefully this will never happen these days, a wrong blood type to a patient and uh, for example if type A, and remember in type A we have a antigen and anti-B antibody is given to type B and type B has B antigen and anti-A antibody. The anti-A antibody in the type B will attack the A antigen and break down the type A donor blood. So uh, imagine that B type cells are trained to defend against A type cells and when they see A antigen they will attack the red blood cells and destroy it. So when this reaction occurs it will lead to basically clamping of blood cells which may lead to microthrombosis and microthrombosis can uh, clog the small vessels and uh, which will lead to multiple organ emboli and uh, uh, multi-organ failure. So that's why it's important to when the transfusion reaction occurs to treat immediately and again you remember this from your uh, basic nursing tra treatment that it, the blood transfusion sh should be discontinued immediately. Um, nephrologist is a very good idea to consult and uh, complications should be anticipated such as uh, renal failure, DIC may happen and even death. So prompt treatment will uh, probably determine the successful treatment. Again this is preventable and the best way to prevent it to make sure that the blood of right type and nowadays we very seldom do matching like giving type O 
to any other types even type O is the universal blood donor we trying to match the we are trying to match the uh, blood with exact type and even the patient has type AB we still won't be giving them random blood we will try to match it in the times of severe blood shortage if it's not possible to obtain correct blood the blood transfusion may be performed by as um, old-fashioned way and matching would be performed Erythroblastosis fatalis is another uh, autoimmune disorder when mother's antibodies will attack and destroy the antigens on baby's blood, baby's red blood cells, and uh, ultimately it may cause death. However, there are cases of survival of the fetus and uh, you know eventual recovery so uh, all of this as you already know is related to rhesus factor and uh, usually uh, the baby will not have any problems if the baby is uh, having a rhesus negative mother and uh, at the same time is baby rhesus positive at the same time second baby is most likely under attack because of the sensitization and raw gam is should be given during second pregnancy and some authorities will suggest to give raw gam even during the first pregnancy if um, if the risk for RH positivity and um, RH negativity conflict is present. So again, this condition only affects rhesus positive babies carried by rhesus negative babies. Of course, if the mother is rhesus positive and the baby is rhesus positive as well, no, nothing uh, significant will happen and the erythroblastosis fetalis the other name for it is hemolytic disease of the newborn treatment may uh, include the transfusion of baby's blood at birth with uh, RH2 at birth and the, the treatment stops the destruction of babies RBCs um, all the over the time of course the transfused blood will be replaced by the baby's own blood but uh, this will prevent the occurrence of um, erythroblastosis fetalis and these are the uh, cases I was saying that the baby still has chances of um, survival the raw gam is an injection that will be given to rhesus negative female to uh, develop uh, antibodies against rhesus uh, positive babies if it's given promptly after the first delivery and uh, it will help to prevent development of RH antibodies. So organ rejection is very uh, common problem that may occur during organ transplantation and this is a special field of medicine and nursing so I'll just brush over this just to give you an idea and uh, most of the time in this course is if it's a specialty I would like to um, 
skip over it because of the fact that we are addressing uh, uh, disorders that will be significant in primary care. So transplant may be attacked uh, after the transplantation by the immune system and the best uh, thing to do in this situation matching the donor closely genetic match of the donor with the uh, uh, recipient of the tissue again um, if acute rejection has to occur it will occur very early and uh, acute rejection may occur um, during the surgical procedure itself and uh, they call it hyperacute or if rejection occurs within the first few weeks they will call it a cure whereas the chronic rejection may occur over period of months to years so chronic rejection is a consequence of vessel damage that decreases the blood flow to donor tissue and uh, death of the donor organ again uh, most um, common uh, approach to this is um, to use immunosuppression medication uh, prior to transplantation and uh, the remainder of the recipient life as well as to uh, consult the recipient about avoidance of high-risk behaviors that may re reduce the immunity and by high-risk behavior like smoking, um, drinking alcohol, the stressful situations, this may all may contribute to a rejection. Immune deficiency disorders is the failure of immune system to protect the affected individual against the disease and they may be congenital genetic or acquired acquired immunodeficiency may be secondary to bone marrow suppression from chemotherapy or radiation uh, it's quite common that patients with uh, organ transplants may have acquired immune deficiencies secondary to uh, medication uh, to suppress the rejection reaction also uh, acquired immune deficiency may occur secondary to destruction of uh, certain lymphocytes such as in case of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome so acquired immunodeficiency syndrome uh, is a consequence of human immunodeficiency virus infections when um, this happens uh, it affects uh, patients uh, lymphocytes specifically CD4 cells are affected and uh, patient gradually will lose immunity secondary to this and uh, breaking this down to stages we will uh, talk about acute infection acute infection um, stage when the transmission of the HIV occurs asymptomatic HIV stage which can last for years symptomatic and advanced this can be all um, the diagnostically staging can be related to a viral load versus the count of CD4 cells and in advanced HIV cases T cell count will be less than 50 per microliter and anti retroviral antiviral medications may slow HIV replication and disease uh, progress and nowadays of course uh, HIV turns into a chronic disorder when 
the, the disease can be managed by chronic medications. Again, patients do not have to be anymore on the 24-7 uh, uh, around the clock regimen, so QID or even more taking drug cocktails and uh, it's possible to manage this disease with fewer frequencies of uh, administration and again uh, the disease can be managed by medication and has chronic character unfortunately at this point there is no approved treatment that may lead to the cure transmission of hiv uh, is uh, determined to occur through the intimate contact and sharing of body fluids and sharing needles uh, of, uh, with infected individuals. Uh, virus has to be in the bloodstream to cause the infection. So there are numerous misconceptions about the transmission and um, unfortunately still among some healthcare providers. It's not possible to acquire HIV from inanimate a objects such as toilet seats, doorknobs, furniture, drinking from a water fountain. Also, social situations such as uh, social kissing, uh, coughing or sneezing uh, will not lead to HIV infection.